What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 472 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. I am Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week and holiday season so far. Lots going on. We had the deadline show over the weekend, final battle over the week, and we have Winter is Coming Tonight, that edition of Dynamite, which I'm looking forward to. And then, of course, Christmas next week as well, or next Sunday to be specific. But a uh, lot to get into. We'll get into all of it here today on the show with your questions from Facebook, from Twitter, from YouTube. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment I usually put up on the post. Um, on you know on, on the post on Tuesday nights on the Facebook page if not on the wall itself last but certainly not least drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video I'll include your comment in next week's edition so let's get right into it with the YouTube questions first we got a bunch of them uh, Nike only and again I have yet to organize the questions I know I say this a lot just haven't had time lately but um, we will get into most of the questions you guys sent in. Um, so it, it, they're all over the place, and you see your, one of your questions answered here, and then another one answered like later on. I apologize for the disorganization. But Nike only will start with them. Their first question was, um, should WWE take an offseason for the month of December? I feel like Raw is just dragging for three hours and nothing exciting is happening, and SmackDown is only good because of the bloodline. Should WWE give their performers the month of December off and come back for the first Raw of the new year? Uh, should they? Maybe. Will they? Never. It's never going to happen. I mean, WWE's been around for so long. Raw has been a staple for WWE for 30 years in January. Never before have they done an offseason because they just can't afford to. Uh, not that they would lose money or whatever, but like if they took time off during the pandemic, I mean, the company wouldn't have folded, but I mean, when I say they can't afford to, the networks won't allow them. That's why you don't see an off season for AEW. That's why you don't see an off season for WWE or impact or any real major company. Um, even NWA for the most part has run all year long, aside from the pandemic when they got shut down pretty much every promotion, unless they got their doors closed, a la ring of honor runs all year long. And a lot of those companies do not run nearly as many shows as WWE does. WWE, from what I understand, will give their performers, like, the weekend of Christmas off. I can't imagine they're going to have weekend, uh, Christmas weekend house shows. I think they're taping the December 23rd SmackDown maybe this Friday or next week. I'm not sure. I, I don't think they're doing anything on Christmas Eve or Christmas itself. They have done shows on Christmas before, like live Raws and SmackDowns, which is fucking dumb. Um, but other than that, though, for the most part, they usually give their performers that, like, holiday time off. Beyond that, they're right back on the road, like, the following week or two. They're never going to have a proper offseason. I think, as other people have suggested, have suggested before, I think the smartest route you can take is cycling your talent in and out. So they're not on the show consistently or constantly. I mean, having people on consistently is key in getting them over and whatnot, obviously. But I'm talking as far as you know, ensuring they don't get hurt or overexposed on the shows. To prevent that, I think if you cycle people in and out, so like, you know, not to this great length, but like Samoa Joe, he was gone for a reason. He had to go film a show. He was off the show for like fucking two or three months. That is a bit of a long time, but taking people off the show for like a month or so so they can kind of relax and recharge their batteries and come back feeling fresh, uh, both physically and in the eyes of the fans, I feel like that's key. And we, we do see that sometimes in... A lot of these companies, especially if they wrap up, you can't have someone take time off in the middle of a storyline and then, unless it's like an injury angle or something. Like Riddle, for example, um, is taking time off right now, but reportedly that's due to a failed drug test. It's not like they're giving him the month off to go hang out at home. Uh, apparently he's going to rehab, but anyway... Um, with that sort of stuff, yeah, after the storyline is over and you want to give them a bit of a break to kind of recharge their batteries so they're not on the show constantly and so they can, you know, heal up any nagging injuries or whatever, that's a great idea. We already kind of see that already in the major companies, pretty much in all these companies. Uh, you can't take an off-season, though. That's just the one of the biggest appeals of pro wrestling is that they're always on. Like, it's on every single week. There is no off-season like football or basketball or baseball or soccer or whatever. They're just constantly going. And that's what makes, you know, creating the programming tough because it's not like an Infinity War type movie where you have this grand climax. I mean, I guess you do kind of with WrestleMania, but they didn't come out with another Marvel movie the following month, the following week. WWE went right back to work and resetting the storylines that Monday on Raw. That's just the nature of the business. 
So you'll never have a proper offseason. I'm not even really in uh, in favor of that anyway, because you have like this grand event, this great event. You have all this momentum. You want to carry over that momentum into the following Monday's Raw, especially now where people's attention spans are so short. If you wait a month or two to bring back the product after like a month or two off, then it's just not going to have that same momentum and they have to start from scratch. So you, you kind of have to have it weekly, but cycling people in and out, as other people have said before, is probably the way to go, and I think we already do kind of see that already. Not as much as we probably should, but it is a good idea, though. Uh, Central Man Network, what's your pick for a wrestler to be in the WWE Hall of Fame in 2023? I said a couple weeks ago, William Regal, but um, now that Regal is indeed on his way back, but we found out last Wednesday that he can't appear on screen reportedly until 2024, that I would assume includes a Hall of Fame induction, because you can't have a Hall of Fame induction without appearing on Peacock or whatever, or on whatever TV network the Hall of Fame airs on nowadays. I don't remember. I think it's Peacock. Um, That probably eliminates that possibility. So probably in 2024, I would put Regal in the Hall of Fame. You can put Finley in there. I'm surprised he isn't in already, to be honest with you. Um, He's one of those guys that should be in there. Miss Elizabeth, I know it would be a a Pothmus induction, but she should be in there already. Andy Kaufman, he's not a wrestler. Obviously, he's more of a celebrity. That would be a celebrity wing induction. Say what you will about the celebrity wing, but that wing, if they want to have it, and I'm okay with them having it, is not complete unless you have Andy Kaufman in that Hall of Fame. And none of this bullshit like, oh, he never actually did anything in WWE or whatever. Dude, there's many, many, many people in that Hall of Fame that did not do jack shit in WWE that are in the Hall of Fame. So the way that I've always looked at it is that the Hall of Fame for WWE encompasses everything they own and acknowledge. So, like, I don't think they would ever, for example, this sounds silly, but, like, they would ever induct Darby Allen into the WWE Hall of Fame for all he did in AEW. If they don't acknowledge AEW, they don't own AEW's footage or whatever, I mean, in an AEW Hall of Fame, would he be in there? Probably down the road, I'm sure. Or, like, a Kenny Omega, for example. That, I think that would be a better example. Would they put Kenny Omega in their own Hall of Fame? Probably never, no, because he never did any... I mean, he was in developmental fucking 20, 15 years ago. But he's never done anything in the promotions that WWE owns. They induct people from WCW all the time, ECW, but not... I mean, New Japan kind of counts. I mean, they've acknowledged New Japan, uh, some of the Japan, you know, Japanese territories. Like, for example, I would expect Great Muda to go into the Hall of Fame this year. And he absolutely should. I think he probably will, too. Especially if they're having him work uh, Shinsuke coming up in a couple weeks on that New Year's Day show over in Wrestle 1 or... I forgot whatever promotion it was, but um, I assume he's going into the Hall of Fame. The trade-off would be, hey, we'll let Shinsuke work this match, but we would love to induct you into the Hall of Fame over WrestleMania weekend. They inducted Liger a couple years ago, and Liger never really did anything at all in WWE. He had that one NXT match and maybe another match many, many years ago. But a lot of his you know, career that WWE acknowledges happened in, um, happened in WCW. And they also probably acknowledge this New Japan stuff as well, because they acknowledge New Japan. They don't own New Japan, but they acknowledge New Japan. I assume Muda would be no different. So Muda comes to mind as well. And also, Tommy Dreamer. Honestly, I'm really surprised Dreamer's not already in there. Uh, For all he accomplished in ECW, they inducted Rob Van Dam a year or two ago. And Obviously, RVD had a great WWE career as well, but Dreamer had a lot of longevity in WWE. had a lot of longevity in wrestling in general. He's still a competes occasionally today in Impact, he would be allowed to do it. Um, They have inducted people from Impact before. Um, Impact's not one of their major threatening companies anyway. They would allow them to do that. So I assume Dreamer would be allowed to be there for the Hall of Fame induction. He's not a leading man or anything, but to be in that induction, he should absolutely be in the WWE Hall of Fame by now. So those are a few of the names that come to mind. Uh, It's honestly a whole new world of possibilities for the Hall of Fame now that Triple H is in charge. Triple H is a very old-school wrestling fan. Not to say that Vince did not know people from fucking 50, 60 years ago. He was around at that point, obviously. But Triple H is a wrestling historian. He acknowledges a lot of the people that came before him and stuff like that. Um, People that Vince may not have been high on or may not have thought people would care about in the Hall of Fame, which might be true but they still deserve their props and acknowledgement and recognition. Triple H might be more willing to put them in the Hall of Fame. So, like, I'm talking more like older school people, like Bruiser Brody, technically already is in the Hall of Fame. Like, he should have had a proper induction. Obviously, he's dead, but like a proper Pothamus induction years ago. I think they already inducted him as part of the Legacy Wing, which was silly. Again, they should have had a proper induction for him, but whatever. 
Um, so yeah, I, I would hope to see more people like that that we probably would not have previously in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Vader's in. Bam Bam Bigelow. I mean, again, another Pothmas induction, but should have been in many, many years ago. I'm surprised he didn't go in over WrestleMania 35 weekend when they were in the New Jersey area. Um, but he's another one that should have been in years ago. You know, Owen Hart, will that ever happen? Maybe. I know Martha's issues are with the company itself, obviously with Vince, but with WWE itself. I don't think she's ever going to work with WWE again, which I completely understand. Uh, and she also has a working relationship now with AEW. Is it possible, though, that they could mend fences now that Triple H is in charge? Yeah, I don't know how close Triple, uh, Triple H was with Owen Hart. He probably was a lot closer with him than fucking Vince McMahon was and the way they treated that situation. So I'm not exactly sure. I don't want to bank on that happening, but I feel like it is more possible now, if only marginally, than it would have been, you know, a year or two ago. Uh, next question from Micah Does It. Do you ever think Nakamura, Shinsuke Nakamura, will ever be back in the main event title picture, maybe even win the WWE or Universal Championship, or is it too late for him? It, it's too late, but not because he's like past this prime. Like Obviously, his prime years are indeed behind him. Could you theoretically put a world championship on Nakamura? Yeah, but the booking would have to be there. I think the damage was done during the Vince era of Shinsuke's time in WWE. Shinsuke has been now in WWE for six, almost seven years I think in February, which is crazy to think about. So he's been here long enough, including his NXT run, that people kind of see him at a certain level. He's at a certain level now to where he's never going to be main event material consistently. Could you give him a one-off fucking world title? I mean, at this point, anything is possible. They gave Kofi Kingston a world title run. Shinsuke Nakamura is not Kofi Kingston, but he is still very over. Anytime he pops up, he still can have very good matches. We saw that in the Intercontinental Championship SmackDown main event that he had against Gunther a couple months ago. Shinsuke is great. I feel like the point in which you should have put the belt on him has passed. That was years ago, 2018, 2019, 2017. We're almost in 2023. He's also in his 40s now. Maybe it's like a token title run, like, oh, you know, just to say you were a world champion or whatever. I don't foresee that happening. Um, it's possible, but I honestly, if I was a betting man, do I ever see him winning a world championship in WWE? The answer is no. I feel like the time has passed. And they kind of see him at a level now in the mid-card where he can put other people over and still get great reactions. Um, his next question, with John Cena announcing his return to SmackDown on December 30th, do you think he will say that he's going to be in the Royal Rumble match? Uh, what could Cena possibly be leading, or his return possibly be leading to? Yeah, that's my expectation. I mean, I'm not getting my hopes up because the last time we saw him on TV was for a purpose. I mean, it was for his 20-year anniversary in WWE. And, you know, we all thought, oh, he's going to announce a match with Theory or set up a match with Theory. He kind of sort of did in that backstage segment they had backstage right before he went out. Granted, Cena interacted with a lot of people that night backstage. He's not facing all of them at WrestleMania. The Theory one was more significant because there have been rumors for a while of a Cena-Theory match. Um, obviously, that's more likely for, I would I would think, WrestleMania than it is like Theory coming out on that SmackDown. Uh, Theory's a Raw guy anyway, so I don't really... The fact he's going to be on SmackDown is interesting, although not all that interesting because, again, they're in Tampa. He's from Tampa, I believe. He probably lives there. He doesn't have to travel. So it's not like he's going out of his way to be at a WWE show. He's probably just in the area. They want to boost the rating for the big show right before the end of the year. That would typically not do well because people are busy around that time of the year. So I don't want to say he's going to be in the Rumble, but it, the timing is interesting. If they want to have star power in that Rumble match and he comes back for a, full, for a full-on run, which we really haven't seen yet in a while. Every time Cena's come back in recent years, he always comes back for, like, just one match. The last time we had a real run from Cena was going into SummerSlam last year. He did have a few matches, but they were all dark matches. He only had one televised match at SummerSlam, lost, and that was it. 2020 came back. He was only back for, like, a month, a lot like in 2021. He came back right in late February, and he faced Wyatt at Mania, the cinematic match, and you know, with the building with no fans. Um, did that whole thing, never wrestled on TV, and that was it. 2019, um, I don't even know if he had a... Did he have a... I mean, he had matches in 2019. They were on TV, though. They were on Raw or SmackDown. They weren't really leading to anything. He was just back for a couple weeks for some weird reason. Again, probably to pop a rating. He didn't compete at Mania. He was on the Raw reunion show, and that was about it. So Cena didn't really have a proper run in 2019. The last time that he had a proper run full of matches like going into WrestleMania, was in 2018. He wrestled on SmackDown at that point. He wrestled on a few of the pay-per-views. He was in the Rumble match. And that was almost five years ago, come January. 
So I don't know if he's interested in doing that. I don't know if he can do that nowadays with all of the big movies he's in and whatever. I would like to see that. I would like to see him in the Rumble and then maybe do something to set up a match of Mania. Um, especially if we're not getting Rock. If Rock and Stone Cold, or at least one of them, if, if not maybe neither of them, but if both of them are going to be at WrestleMania, neither of them are competing on Raw or SmackDown leading up to Mania, nor should they. Cena is a big enough name to where you can also keep him off the shows in the ring until Mania, but I think it would help if he competed a little bit going into WrestleMania, at least in my opinion. So, we'll see. I think he could be in the Rumble. Again, if I'm a betting man, yes or no, I'm going to say no just because we didn't see him announce anything the last time he was here, but it is likely, though, not to uh, rule out that possibility. Billy from YouTube as well, he says... Uh, Graham, a lot of rumors the last 48 hours about Vince coming back to WWE. Surely he has to take a step back now as WWE has flourished since his departure. What are your thoughts? Oh, 100% those are bullshit. Not not bullshit. I mean, obviously those the re- the rumors and the reports I'm sure are legitimate. Um, it was one of the recent Wall Street Journal articles which broke the whole Vince McMahon scandal earlier this year to begin with. So there is credence to those reports, but there's a big difference between saying that Vince is interested in a comeback and that a Vince McMahon takeover of WWE is likely. Because I don't think the latter is likely at all. I honestly... Could it happen? Sure. It it absolutely could happen if he makes a strong enough play to come back. Well, with all the allegations surrounding him, they did the whole investigation, he thought it was going to blow over. What a fucking idiot. Um, the company is better off without him in charge. Say what you will about Triple H and his creative and how he handles things. It's infinitely better than Vince. We can at least say that much. It could not get much worse under Vince's watch. We needed the change. We got the change. It's been a better show. The shows aren't great, but they're better without Vince McMahon in charge. And even behind the scenes, morale is up. Stock is doing well for the most part. Why the fuck would they want to go backward and bring back Vince? Why would anyone want it with Vince back aside from Vince McMahon? So, again, anything can happen. Because I also didn't think Vince was going anywhere either. I, I feel like every time... I always go off of logic and just... Not just logic, but like, okay, if there's a if there's a pattern of things happening, then that's probably what's going to happen. Vince has never been booted from power before. Why would this be any different? And then he gets booted from power. Cody Rhodes is not leaving AEW. Why would he? And then he leaves AEW. So I, I can't really go off of that anymore because 2022 kind of blew that out of the water. Um, but I really hope that I am right on this one and he doesn't fucking come back because we do not need him. No one wants him back. Stay the fuck home. Um, last YouTube question, or two, I guess, from Joe M., um, his first one was, I think it was you back in the day, he said, that who did the article for Bleacher Report uh, of good theme songs that went to waste on less than stellar wrestling careers. Are there any current wrestlers who would fit in this category today? I think the Trustbusters have an excellent song, but they've become the job group in AEW. Tatum Paxley also has a banger theme song, but she normally comes out to Ivy Nile's theme. Um, I don't know if I did that article. I may have. That sounds familiar. I've done articles similar to that. I know I did an article back in the day, like for What Culture, years ago, talking about like great theme songs that no one really remembers or like were used on smaller. Maybe it was me, but I don't know if I did it for Bleacher Report. But anyway, um, those are two good ones. I mean, at least the Tatum Paxley one. I've heard Paxley's theme. She does have a good theme song. Um, I enjoy her theme. I like Zoe Stark's song. I'm not a big Zoe Stark fan, but she has been better off as a heel, so I won't say her. I'm going to be honest with you. I think the Trustbusters theme fucking sucks. Every time I hear it, I'm not a fan of it. Maybe I haven't heard it from start to finish. But every time... Maybe it's just because they're awful. The group is awful. But every time I see them come out, the song puts me to sleep. The song isn't good enough to get me interested in a fucking Trustbusters match. They're an awful group. Um, I do like Tatum Paxley's theme, though. The first name that came to mind, and they are doing better recently... Maybe he ends up doing poorly, but he did have a good showing at Deadline. Joe Gacy. Joe Gacy has a really good fucking theme. I feel like that's the perfect answer to your question, because Alexis and I say all the time, I mean, Alexis likes Joe Gacy less than I do, but we say all the time, Schism, or whatever they call themselves, sucks. I think the stable sucks. I mean, they're better off lately than they were a couple months ago. They added Ava Rain, and it is a little bit more interesting, a little bit, but the theme song is still the best part of the group. And again, I'm not the biggest Joe Gacy fan, but what makes him better is the theme song. So that, to me, would be my answer to you. Um, his second question, was Grayson Waller winning the Iron Survivor Challenge the right call? I thoroughly believe it was, but I see a lot of people saying it should have been Carmelo Hayes. Waller is the most hated heel in NXT at the moment, so what better way to kick his ass, or what? so who better, rather, to kick his ass than Braun Breaker? Whereas I don't really hear anyone 
clamoring for Melo to get whooped by anybody. So here's the thing. I mean, people, and myself included, were pulling for Carmelo because I want him as NXT champion. The I, I actually really like Grayson Waller. I don't know if I'm in the minority there. I think he's very good. He's entertaining. He's great in the ring. He's come a long way from where he started out as a year and a half ago. Grayson Waller is great. He could be main roster ready soon as well. Um, I think this is... I, I'm fine with him winning for a few different reasons. I was happy with that. I mean, it was better than fucking Gacy or JD McDonough again or even Axiom. Waller was a great consolation prize for a few reasons. One, he came from the show Survivor in Australia or whatever. The, he has Survivor He has survivor ties, so it makes perfect sense. So for that reason alone, it makes sense for him to win. The second reason being, if they do the match on TV, probably New Year's Evil in a couple of weeks, that's a perfect TV match. Waller and Breaker as like a premium live event main event. I fucking hate calling them premium live events, but... That is a premium live event, main event, doesn't really work for me, brother. So, like, doing that as a TV special main event, I think is perfect. You do Breaker and Waller at New Year's Evil. And, again, I'm fine with Melo not winning the Iron Survivor Challenge as long as he becomes champion or gets a title match at Vengeance Day or Stand and Deliver. Stand and Deliver is a bigger question mark just because... If they do that, then what do you do with them in the meantime? Yeah, I know people have said, and I myself, I haven't watched NXT yet, by the way, but people have said maybe, you know, maybe he um, feuds with Apollo Crews. Is that really like a four-month-long feud? Probably not. So I'm not really sure what you do with him in the meantime. Um, I mean, he can kind of lay low for now and then get a title shot after New Year's Evil. That, to me, is perfectly fine. But yeah. Um, I think Waller versus Breaker for versus uh, Breaker rather for uh, New Year's Evil makes perfect sense. It should be a really good match. It's a fresh match. Breaker wins, and then we move on to uh, Breaker and Mello with Mello becoming champion, probably a Vengeance Day. So that's how I would book it, brother. We go to the those are the YouTube questions, uh, questions Facebook questions. Um, no L says now that 2022 is almost over in two weeks. What NXT superstar would you say has had a breakout year for both the men and the women's wrestlers? I mean, breakout would obviously have to be Roxanne Perez. She got signed this year. She was signed, I think in March. She debuted on the show mere weeks later. Um, she just became NXT women's champion last night. She was NXT women's tag team champion for a cup of coffee earlier this year with Cora Jade. Um, she's been all over the show. She won the inaugural women's, uh, Iron Survivor Challenge match. She beat Cora Jade back at Halloween Havoc. She's had a great year. She, To me, aside from Mandy, and then she's had very good matches to boot as well. She's gotten over. She, to me, has been the women's wrestler of 2022 for NXT. Day. So easily a breakout year for her. Tiffany Stratton, I will also say, has improved a lot. Um, the whole daddy's little rich girl shit is awful, and hopefully they tone that down a little bit more, which they already have when she comes back soon. Um, she's improved a lot. I thought the Wendy Chu match was better than it had any right to be. And she's uh, pretty decent in the ring at this point. I mean, she's not great, but she reminds me of Bianca to where she comes from a, from an athletic background. And if she can kind of get the character stuff down pat and improves that end and gets better in the ring, she has real potential. So Roxanne Perez and Tiffany to a certain extent. For the men, Breaker had already really broken out last year. Uh, Waller, Hayes... D'Angelo, I think, had a really good year for the most part. Wesley, probably. Wesley, probably, had the breakout year. D'Angelo, all those other guys were already kind of getting going in late 2021. D'Angelo won that feud with Santos. Um, they had good chemistry and whatnot. So, D'Angelo, but probably Wesley, because at the beginning of the year, he was NX the tag team champion with Nash Carter. Nash Carter gets fired within days of them becoming champions, like a week or two. So he has to drop that belt, breaks off on his own abruptly, and then kind of has to work his way up the ladder and just became NXT North American champion recently. So Wesley has always been very talented dating back to his Impact days because uh, you know, I remember watching him back then, you know, years ago, and he was always great. And he worked well as a tag team guy, but I always knew there was more with him there. There was always more with him uh, as a single star. So I'm glad they experimented with that. They put the belt on him. He's doing really well. So Wesley and Roxanne Perez, your, your you know, current North American and NXT Women's uh, Champions, respectively. Their second question, do you think MJF can be the modern era version of Hall of Famer Roddy Piper? Yeah, I mean, I hate to compare people like that. Like, oh, can John Moxley be like the modern day version of Stone Cold Steve Austin? There will never be another Stone Cold Steve Austin. There will never be another Roddy Piper. 
Is he close to Roddy Piper? Sure. The difference with Piper, though, I think a lot of people forget. Obviously, his biggest success came in WWE, was never a world champion. MJF is world champion already. Piper was probably champion elsewhere. He wasn't world champion in WWE. MJF could very well be world champion in WWE someday. But um, th there's a lot of similarities there, but a lot of differences too. Again, MJF to me is a perennial main event player. Not that Piper wasn't, but he was always kind of the setup guy for people like Hogan. And even in WCW later on as well. Um, MJF, I think... I was going to say he's better in the ring than Piper. I don't want to make that claim because I haven't seen enough Piper matches to really justify that. Because I largely saw Piper in his later years. Um, they're, they're, let's, let's say they're on the same level. But even with that being said, Piper, I think a lot of people forget, spent a lot of his time in WWE later on in his career as a babyface. Like, he started out as a heel in the mid-80s. But from there on, he was pretty much a babyface for the rest of his tenure there. MJF will never be a babyface for more than, like, a year. If he ever turns face, and it's inevitable, he's not going to spend a majority of his career as a face. It will almost always be as a heel. That's just the nature of the character. So there are similarities. There are some differences. Um, but he's close enough. As far as the mic work goes, he's fantastic. Um, he's very close to Piper on that, for sure. And can be very... Can be compared to Piper in the way that he can be known as one of the best modern-day talkers... Um, if not ever in wrestling history, if he can continue on the rate that he's currently improving at and currently going at, whatever, a lot like Piper was many years ago. So he can be included in the conversation of Piper as one of the best talkers of all time, as long as he can continue on the trend that he's currently on, that he currently finds himself on. Uh, we go to the Twitter questions. Let's see here. Uh, we start with at Iwagu91. He says, uh, it's Wednesday. You know what that means. Do you think that Luke Harper was underutilized as a singles competitor ever or I think you meant to say more than Cesaro, more than even Cesaro. The word more wasn't in your question, but I'm including it there because I think that's what you meant to say. Was Luke Harper more underutilized than Cesaro? Um, yes and no. I, it's, it, I don't know. I don't think Brody was ever going to be, in WWE anyway, like a world champion. I could have seen Cesaro as like a breakout main event player. I, I honestly, for as good as Harper was, I never really saw him as a world champion in WWE. In AEW, when he became leader of the Dark Order, maybe, maybe. Um, underutilized, though. Like, you're not saying underrated. I don't know. I think Harper was... I mean, yeah, he never really got a shot on his own in WWE. I mean, he did for a very brief period as Intercontinental Champion in late 2014. He was champion for a literal fucking month before he dropped the belt to Dolph Ziggler. Yeah, I mean, he was, I would say, more underutilized than Cesaro. Cesaro, at least, never really reached the ceiling that he probably should have in WWE. But at the same time, though, he was United States champion for a good stretch. He was also tag team champion, like, fucking five times or whatever. Harper was champion a few times with Eric Rowan, but even their team never really got going consistently the way that they probably should have, and he was gone by 2019. He spent a year as the Bludgeon Brothers, which was a silly gimmick, but... You know, they made the most of it. So, yeah, you know what? I would say Harper was probably more underutilized than Cesaro because we never really got an extended singles run from Harper in WWE the way that we should have with a lot. We, we did see extended singles or singles run for Cesaro, singles runs for Cesaro in WWE. He even fucking made him into a pay-per-view with Roman Reigns in 2021. We were never going to see that with Luke Harper. Um, are you looking forward to Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay at Wrestle Kingdom, he says. I am. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the whole show. Um, I don't cover, obviously, as you guys know, consistently Wrestle Kingdom, or not Wrestle Kingdom, but uh, New Japan. I don't really watch much New Japan at all, but I do make it a point and have in recent years to go, to go out of my way to watch Wrestle Kingdom. I think I watched it in 2015, 2016 that caught certain matches, 2017, I don't think I watched the whole show, but I did watch um, the main event of Okada versus Omega. 2018, I think I watched the whole show. 2019, I don't know if I watched any of the show, but I remember the show. Uh, I did watch it in... Did I, I, I don't know if I watched it in 2020. I did watch it in 2021, and I did watch it in 2022, and then I do review it for my website. So, I will be watching it this year between the Omega Osprey stuff. Um, I think it's Okada and White again, right, for the New Japan title, which we've seen a lot, so I'm not really overly th you know enthused about that, but I'm sure it's going to be a great match. You know, we have that, obviously the Sasha Banks rumors and FTR being on the card, among others. I forget, There was one other person, FTR, 
Sasha, Omega. Oh, maybe Carl Anderson as well, which I'm not super pumped for that, but it is cool. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to Omega and Osprey. It's a long time coming, and it should be an amazing match, especially in New Japan as well, where there's not really any limits as far as what they could do in the ring. Um, his next question, your thoughts on Dustin Rhodes being set to retire next year? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know, how old is he? 50-something? Let's look it up. Dustin Rhodes. Because he still can go at his age and do a great job. He is currently 53, which, it's not really that old. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, the guy has to retire. I mean, dude, fucking Jericho's like 51, 52. He was just Ring of Honor World Champion. I know Dustin Rhodes is not the star that Jericho is, but still. And Sting's still out there at 63, 10 years older than Dustin. You know, wrestles way more than Dustin does on TV, and that's just in terms of booking and not as far as whether Dustin can go or not. Um, so it is a bummer that he's retiring, but, you know, I hope he goes out on a high note. He's had a lot of good matches, and, you know, since joining AEW, he's had a really good run for himself. So, uh... Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I don't want to say it's disappointing because, because he's had uh, quite the, quite the year as far the quite you know quite the last couple of years of his career and doing all this cool stuff and having great matches and whatever. It might be time for him to retire if he's not going to be used on TV anyway. But I hope he goes out on a high note. The next question comes from let's see, Kyle Rochelle nineteen. To me, Bianca Belair needs to lose the championship soon. Now it won't be to Alexa Bliss. But if Becky Lynch, Rhea Ripley, and Alexa Bliss are more popular and interesting than the championship, I think it's a problem. Do you wait until Rhea wins the Rumble? Kyle, I know you have an issue with Bianca as champion. You send in questions every week about this. I don't answer them every week because I feel like I've said this a lot. I've enjoyed Bianca's reign as champion. I don't know what you're talking about. I've been to a lot of shows this year. She is fucking over. Bianca is very over. She is even more over than Alexa. Alexa, babyface Alexa, is not fucking interesting at all. Going back to the Wyatt heel Alexa Bliss shit is not interesting either. That that shit is fucking terrible. If she goes back to being five feet of fury Alexa Bliss, then yes, maybe, maybe. But whatever she, I mean, it is interesting what she's doing now. But if she goes back to the Wyatt dark Alexa, that shit's awful. No thanks. Uh, Rhea Ripley's great. Becky's great. But Becky, I don't know. Be- Becky is over, obviously. Obviously, she will always probably more be more over than Bianca. But not by much. Bianca is still very, very over. She's had a very good run. She's had a lot of great matches. She spent fucking forever feuding with damage control, sure. But she, at least she's had direction as champion. And they're already on to the next contender. So, no, I would not take the belt off of Bianca and put it on fucking Alexa Bliss or put it on Becky. No, absolutely not. I would not put it on Alexa either. Uh, Rhea would be a good choice, but you can't do that till WrestleMania. I always thought Bianca would face Charlotte at Mania and Rhea faces Beth. Because they are obviously going to cap off that story, whether it's Rhea versus Beth or Finn and Rhea versus Beth and Edge. Maybe at Mania. Who knows? Honestly, it probably will be a Mania at this point, at the rate that we're currently going. Uh, Because we haven't seen Edge back in two months. So if they don't do that, though, and they have Rhea win the Rumble, because I'd rather have Rhea win the Rumble than fucking Charlotte again. No thanks. Uh, Rhea winning the Rumble would be great. And we can get Bianca and Rhea finally at WrestleMania. That's totally fine by me. And I probably would have Rhea beat Bianca for the belt of Mania. Not because Bianca's not interesting. But by that point, she would have been champion for a year. And Rhea never really got her redemption after losing the championship a couple of years ago. And she's been great recently as a heel. So to put the belt on her would be uh, perfectly fine by me. At BillMeister88, his question was, Have you heard any more on Money in the Bank ladder matches being at Mania this year? If true, who would be your picks to win the men's and women's Money in the Bank? I haven't heard more on that since the initial reports and what Triple H kind of alluded to during the conference, uh, the press conference a couple of weeks ago. My speculation is, and I'm not one to make predictions, I am honestly pretty sure that we are getting the Money in the Bank ladder matches at Mania this year. I mean, it just makes sense. You do one with the men on one night and the other with the women on the other night. That just makes sense to me. Um, Regardless of when they happen, who would be my early, early, early uh, Money in the Bank winner, like my picks for the men's and women's Money in the Bank ladder matches? For the men's LA night, easily 120% LA night. The man screams Money in the Bank. Give him the briefcase. Give him the championship at some point. For the women... Liv won it this year, and it was great. Um, I'm trying to think. Who's on each roster? Raquel, no thanks. Lacey Evans, no thanks. I like Raquel, but that's not interesting to me. 
Um, it also is more a matter of like what stories they're telling going into Mania or going into into the Money in the Bank pay per view if they do it back on that pay per view again. Because if there's a story that makes sense for like Bailey to win it, then sure. But I just don't see that happening. Um, I also don't want Bailey to win it. She's already won it before, and that's just an example. Hmm. There's not. I mean, I guess one of the newer women. One of the newer women would be cool. Like whether it be Mia Yim, Tegan Knox. Um, they have brought back a lot of women. Emma, Candice LeRae. I'm gonna be biased and just say Tegan Knox because I'm a big Tegan Knox fan. I want to see her get her due. I would love to see Tegan Knox back in the title picture. Um, and LA Knight's a heel, and Tegan Knox is a babyface. I know they're both from SmackDown, but who gives a shit? One's a face, one's a heel. That kind of evens it out. So uh, yeah, that's what I would do. At E13A, thoughts on Roxanne Perez ending Mandy Rose's NXT Women's Championship reign. I haven't seen the match yet. I haven't watched NXT yet, but I saw it on uh, social media. RJ was the first one to tell me about it over text. And, I mean, if he didn't tell me, I would have saw your question anyway because I haven't watched the show yet. That's pretty fucking cool. I'm, I'm in completely in favor of that. I didn't know if they would actually do it. Perez became the number one contender at deadline over the weekend. I'm surprised they did it this soon as opposed to building up to it, but... Hey, that's perfectly fine by me. I've always feared, as you guys know, that they were going to build up Nikita Lyons to be the one to dethrone Mandy Rose. I'm very happy that was not the case, because Nikita is just not good. Uh, Roxanne Perez is great. Like I said earlier, she's had a great year, and that's an awesome way of capping it off. For a woman that was the Ring of Honor Women's World Champion at this time a year ago, and didn't really have a contract anywhere, because Ring of Honor just closed, uh, to go from that to competing on... Impact and MLW and being on, I think, on Dark at one point, and now being in WWE on NXT and ending Mandy Rose's big run, that's awesome. So I'm very happy to see that. Um, at E13A, do you have a favorite slash and or least favorite uh, current commentary team? Not really. I honestly think Rick Abani and Caprice Coleman do a great job for the Ring of Honor commentary. We don't hear them often, but I think they do a great job. Um, the Dynamite team is fine. Excalibur is okay. Um, I actually, I think Excalibur is good, but like the fast talking and the just, I don't know. They don't really have a lot of organization. Tony doesn't really add anything on commentary. Shivani at this point. Um, I forget who else is there. Taz, Taz is great. The Dynamite commentary team is not my favorite. The Rampage commentary team is not my favorite. I think Cole and Barrett. Cole and Barrett and Cole and McAfee are probably my favorite commentary teams in all of wrestling right now. Um, Kevin Patrick and Corey are fine. I like Kevin Patrick. I'm biased because I think the guy's just fucking great as far as, like, he just seems like such a really nice person. At the same time, is he a good fit for the voice of Raw? Not really. In the last couple months, I've proven that. Um, I don't hate the team as much as other people. People say he's awful. I don't I don't really listen to the commentary as much as most, but from what I do hear of the commentary teams from all these companies, to me, my favorite would be probably whatever combination of Cole and Barrett or Cole and McAfee we get, because they're all great. They're Both combinations are very good. Um, let's see, his next question. What do you know about James Cameron? What was his next question? Well, I know he's obviously a very... A uh, successful director, obviously did Avatar, among many other movies, Titanic as well. He knows what he's talking about. The first thing that comes to mind with James Cameron, in addition to his movies, were the dumb comments that he, make year, that he made years ago about, like, oh, there's too many superhero movies, there's too many Marvel movies. And the guy goes ahead and announces fucking eight Avatar movies. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? You know what I mean? So, um, I don't really have much of an opinion on him one way or the other. I can't call him an idiot, because he obviously knows what he's doing. He's made a lot of successful movies. Uh, but making comments like that are just so unnecessary and stupid. So that's all I'm going to say on James Cameron, I guess. Um, how much would you care, or how much do you care, he asks, about the experience of watching movies in a theater? Yeah, I think it makes a big difference. Um, I don't know if that's related to my question from uh, yesterday, or my, not my question, but my tweet from Monday or Tuesday about how you know, I, I prefer to watch stuff in a theater, but I really don't have much of a desire to sit through fucking three-plus hours of Avatar, Way of the Water. I mean, I heard it's great. I don't really give a fuck about Avatar at all. You guys know that. Um, it's it, it's meant to be seen in a theater, and I don't really want to sit in a theater to watch a three-plus-hour a three plus hour movie that I don't really want to see in the first place. I'd rather just watch it for free on Disney+. Plus. But again, if it's meant to be seen in a the theater, that kind of takes away from it, so whatever. Um, but even still, I much prefer to see stuff in a theater, even if it costs more to go and buy popcorn and tickets and whatever, as opposed to watching it at home. There have been plenty of movies in the last year or so that have come out on streaming services. For example, Glass Onion, that's coming out on Netflix, you know, later this month. I wanted to see it in a theater because that's where I saw the first one. 
And it was great, and I loved it. And I, I would rather watch it, because I feel like I get too distracted if I'm at my home watching it, or whatever. I mean, there's a variety of reasons. It's better to watch it on the big screen with a nice popcorn with other people. Um, you know, watching it at home, people might prefer that. I much prefer to watch stuff in a theater, whether it's a Marvel movie, a Star Wars movie, anything really. Glass Onion, Bullet Train, Violent Night I just saw recently. That was an excellent movie. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I would much prefer watching stuff in a theater, even if it's shit that came out decades ago. For example, I loved watching Ghostbusters in a theater and Jurassic Park in a theater. Not when they first came out, but theaters were putting them back in theaters just in the last couple of years during COVID and whatever. And it was fucking cool. I hope we would see more of that. Um, last question from Matt Noob underscore N underscore Co TV. With Asuka getting a character change due to her strange behavior on Twitter, will fans finally see the Kana persona on WWE? And do you want to see Alexa or do you want to see Asuka in Bray's faction, or do you think Bray is only targeting Alexa Bliss? I think he's only targeting Alexa. I don't think he's doing a faction. I made that very clear before. He could, sure. I don't think he is at this point. That's pretty obvious to me anyway. But um I don't even want to see Bliss with Wyatt either. I want to see Wyatt on his own doing his own thing. The faction, maybe if it's interesting, definitely not Alexa Bliss. No thanks. Um, no, I don't want to see Kana with Wyatt either. I don't know if we'll get flat out Kana in WWE. She'll always be Asuka. Uh, could we see a Kana esque, you know, persona on WWE TV? To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, she was a complete killer in Japan. I don't think we see that version of her entirely. We might see 70% of it, though, from, like, the makeup to a more aggressive attitude. I hope we do, because I've said this before. Noob, I know you're the biggest Asuka fan in the world. Asuka has not been interesting to me as a character in probably two or three years. She is great, don't get me wrong, but the dumb fucking... I thought the face paint was stupid. It was cool at first a few years ago, but that was years ago. She acts like a clown. They have her out there, like, screaming in Japanese, rambling on purpose... We, we know she could speak English, or at least if she's going to speak Japanese, not to just scream and ramble. Like, that was Vince's idea of what Asuka is. Like, oh, she's just this rambling Japanese woman who doesn't know any English and whatever. It's like, it was just so fucking stupid. She was out there literally acting like a clown. A lot of people found it entertaining. I have found it dumb for years now, so I'm glad we're finally moving away from that. I liked what we saw from Asuka on Monday's Raw. No face paint, no dumb mannerisms. No dumb jumping around and dancing. No no one is ready for Asuka. She says it a million fucking times. It's so annoying. Um, and, and it's not her fault. It's what they have her doing. But what we got on Raw was great and a nice step in the right direction. So I hope we get more of that. And I hope we do get more of that Kana from Japan in WWE because that would be very cool. And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 472 here today of Hashtag Ask GSM for December 14th, 2022. Uh, like I said, if you want to send in a question to the show, you could do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Um, so thank you guys, as always, for sending in the questions. I appreciate it. I did forget to note and promote this earlier, but... Now available, now available to vote on, that is, the 2022 WWE slash AEW Year in Review Awards over on WrestleRant.com. I mentioned it last week. The polls have been open since Friday. So go out of your way. Go vote in the polls. Um, a lot of categories. I think 14 categories in total. Check it out, WrestleRant.com. <coughs> Excuse me, the link is right there. Um, I also tweet it pretty much every day on Twitter to promote it. So <coughs> if you haven't already, go vote. Let your voice be heard in the polls. And we will reveal the results and review the results on WrestleRant Radio, the final one of the year. That being, I think, I think it's December 29th is the episode. And I will close the polls on December 28th. So keep that in mind, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. So if you haven't already voted, please do so. With all that being said, guys, have an awesome one. Enjoy the rest of your holiday season. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.